Onc Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onc Live. The timing of treatment for focal lymphoma partly depends on the staging of the disease. Uh, for patients who has limited stage follicular lymphoma, uh, treatment purposes is really curative uh, because many of those patients when treated with the uh, radiotherapy, radiation therapy, uh, can achieve a cure. So for those patients, as soon as we make a diagnosis, we tend to treat those patients. Whereas for the patients, actually a majority of the follicular lymphoma patients were diagnosed with advanced stage. So for those patients who are not symptomatic, we tend to choose a watch and wait approach. The time to consider treatment is uh, when patients are having either symptomatic disease, such as the B symptoms with fevers, chills, night sweats, uh, weight loss due to poor appetite or uh, severe fatigue. So those B symptoms are indication for treatment. In addition, if a patient is having bulky lymphadenopathy that's causing symptoms or causing impending organ compression, that's another indication. And also for patients who are having uh, end organ uh, damage, such as uh, um, renal failure due to compression or due to pleural effusions or ascites uh, from the lymphoma compressing in the lymphatic system, that's another consideration of treatment. And also for patients who are developing cytopenia due to the lymphoma burden in the bone marrow. So when the bone marrow is not functioning well due to the overwhelming amount of lymphoma cells in the marrow, that's another indication to treat. So for the patients who are having no symptoms and no bulky adenopathy and no organ compromise, those patients can be just a watch and wait uh, with periodic monitoring. It seems sort of antithetical, but watch and wait has been a standard of care for patients with follicular lymphoma. The patients come in and you tell them they've got cancer, I'm not going to treat you, come back in three months. And it's very hard for them to accept that. But it's based on a number of clinical trials, most of them quite old, in which patients with low tumor burden disease and who are asymptomatic were randomized to early intervention or not and the outcome was the same. So watch and wait has become a standard because why subject patients to chemotherapy if it's not going to be beneficial and if they can wait and get treated later? And as I tell patients, every treatment we give them has toxicity, expense, and nuisance, and if you wait long enough, newer drugs will come along that are more effective and less toxic, and that's where we are now. We have a plethora of new drugs out there, such as uh, idelalisib and others, which target pathways within the B cell. S many of these new drugs are oral, they're very effective, and they're well tolerated. Has this impacted when we start treatment of patients? In my mind, no. I have patients with follicular lymphoma I have been watching and waiting for 10, 15 years. They've never been treated. Why should I give them any form of therapy? So watch and wait is still a very standard approach until there are specific indications to treat the patient, such as disease-related symptoms, progressive or bulky lymphadenopathy, progressive splenomegaly, and other features such as that. Um, if a patient has that, then we discuss the various treatment options. But in the absence of evidence of progressive disease or bulky disease, or disease-related symptoms, watching and waiting remains a very viable option for patients with follicular lymphoma. With follicular lymphoma patients, the goal is always going to be to improve progression-free survival. And ultimately, hopefully, that will translate into improvement in overall survival. The important consideration whenever you're discussing overall survival, of course, is to make sure that our therapy isn't going to diminish that outcome. So it certainly is important to sequence the more benign therapies versus the more aggressive therapies in a way that's going to allow basically the toxicities to be delayed as long as possible. One of the most important pieces of data that we will eventually get is whether or not bendamustine is associated with long-term 
uh, secondary myeloid neoplasia and needs to be avoided in these patients. We already know from the current data that bendamustine plus rituxan is actually better and less toxic than our CHOP, and that certainly has had a tremendous impact upon how we care for our patients. But with the advent of other therapies like lenalidomide and rituxan or idelisib, ibrutinib, and other B cell receptor antagonists coming down, as well as other small molecule inhibitors, the hope would be that we could even push out the more toxic chemotherapy agents further.